what are the perils of macros? What I mean by this is, what are the limitations of existing macro systems? Where do they um, create problems of maintenance of code? And what are really the, the difficulties that a programmer will, will face when using macro systems? So the major problem perhaps is really the unclear computational model. Because macros, macros are essentially generating code, it is not very clear, it is not obvious what is the generate code is going to do. So most macro systems have no way of describing or, or declaring what is the side effect of a macro. So if you perform some code transformation, if you call a macro, you could think that you're actually calling a function, but in reality, it's maybe generating 300 lines of code. It could be doing all sorts of implicit side effects that are uh, mismatching your assumptions as a programmer. So it's really important to have macro systems whenever a developer uses macros in their code it should be very clear to others what is going on what does that macro do what are the side effects how do you how do you how should you what are what are should be the caution to have when using it essentially the computational model has to be very well documented otherwise it might produce insidious and very subtle bugs in the user code Another major limitation is its limited comp composability. Because as we've seen before, so far, we've looked at developing all sorts of code that uses as unit of composability the function. We have uh, function declarations that can be created as values, passed around, stored in data structures, combined in multiple different ways. We saw how to develop libraries of uh, function combinators, uh, monadic, co monadic code. We talked about a bit how to write uh, control flow using monadic operations, right? And that's all thanks to the power of functional, ab functional abstraction. With macros, because you are introducing an unknown computation model, you are limiting the composability of your code. Whoever uses that macro is now in a different world that might clash with the existing assumptions of whoever is using, thinking it, it is a function when it's not. So that could be a problem, for instance, when you're, as we've seen, when you guys were using promises and promises behave very differently. You cannot compare them. They have this very subtle side effect thing where you can call it once and then it caches the, the performance, uh, which might be problematic if you have side effects. So that is um, a very different computation model for all the rest that we've learned about, which is just based on functions. So with macros, you have that power. And with that power, you create the problem of how do you compose things? So it, it's really something that could be, that has to be very well documented again, so that users can be can understand how to compose it and how module your macro is. Another serious problem that most module systems have to deal with, or maybe just don't deal with, is because you are generating code, now you're, you're populating the user code with things that are internal, that are generated by whatever your macro is doing. So now there's a variable that didn't exist in your code, but it was generated by the macro, so when you have an error, runtime error, your user will be faced with that weird code that they don't care about. They don't know what it is. It's internal to the macro, but somehow it appears at runtime. And this is a big problem. So what happens is you have this, what I'm calling stack trace obfuscation, which is really um, very confusing outputs because they are leaking out internal information that is just um, an integral part of a macro system. If you're, if you ever use Java, for instance, 
the closest thing to macros are uh, aspect-oriented programming libraries, such as Aspect J. And if you ever use that, you will see very quickly that you have, uh, if you have a, an exception, you will have lots of code with, um, with function calls that have never appeared. Another example where you can see that, for instance, if you're programming in Java, is if you run a test case, you will have, and if you run it from the command line, if you use JUnit, you will see a big stack trace with lots of calls for JUnit. You don't really care what those things are doing, but for some reason they appear there. They appear because they are being called by some framework. This is That's a similar problem, right? Whenever you have this notion of inversion of control, whatever is inverting is kind of polluting the error, the user's error. So that is something that macros have to deal with, and it becomes really hard to understand what's going on. Additionally, whenever you have bugs in macros, it's really hard to debug, and it's really non-trivial how to handle them. For instance, in C, because the macro system is really an add-on, it's something orthogonal to the language, there's really no way, no, the programming language doesn't provide any facility to debug such errors. So it's really up to the user to handle them. But in Racket, there is some support for it. So there is at least some support for this kind of problem. Additionally, the problem of macro systems is that they are, you are able to do whatever you want. So generally, you can have a bug in a macro that could render, that could, because you are running code, that code could not terminate. You could have any kind of bug that would stall the compilation. So your code wouldn't even, the user code would not even load because you have a bug in the macro implementation. So that is something that is very, problematic and it could introduce a big deal in terms of security. So if you have code that could be used by anyone and that and you have a bug in your macro system, you could actually be introducing a security breach in your uh, production code. So the, the bottom line is that you should be very careful in declaring macros. So you should do it sparingly and with caution and document them very well and make sure that they are very simple. So in the next videos, we're going to learn a bit how to define and use macros uh, by means of examples. We're going to talk about a thing called macro hygiene. Um, so macros manipulate syntactic terms, as we talked about. That That is just to say, it's just code that is, it, you are implementing a function that takes a piece of code and is able to either generate more code, mutate that code, maybe return a new tree, and that tree represents an AST like we've learned. So an interp the difference between an interpreter and a compiler is that the interpreter is actually executing an AST, whereas the compiler is just transforming the AST from one representation to the next. What a macro system is doing is transforming one AST to the same type of AST, but it could be in a different order, let's say. Whereas a compiler usually is generating another type of AST, right? From Java to assembly, for instance. So the macro system is not operating at the lexical level. That is to say, it's not parsing your code. It's really just taking an AST as an AST. So it was already parsed. You already have the abstract representation of the code. And then what the macro system is doing is just transforming it. So you are, you are aware of, you know, what is a literal, what is an identifier, what is some, basically all the constructors. What we saw so far in our ASTs, we had terms, we had sequences, we had function calls, we had function declarations, values, literals, and so on. So those would be, if you were to write a macro system, those are, would be the terms that we could be able to manipulate. In the last module, what we're going to learn is to write a compiler at the high level. So not a compiler like would generate assembly, but something more similar to what a macro would do. So let's look at a few, um, a well-known problem of macro systems. So if you look at the C macro, there is this notion 
called unstructured expansion. That is to say that in C, the macro system is very weak, which means it has no notion of scoping or lexical scoping or even lexical structure. So for, for C, it's just a string of tokens, right? So it's, it's basically the only thing it does is it's um, find and replaces text. So it doesn't know about the structure of text, the structure of code. So we, we, what does that mean? Well, if we let's say we are defining addition and we define it in C with a, ha, a pound define and then we write the name of the macro add and we add two parameters X and Y. And we say that whenever I, whenever I, I call add X, Y, I should return uh, X plus Y. But that is just textual replacement. So if I were to write expression add one, two times three, that would expand to one plus two times three. Notice the that the um, because the multiplies has more precedence over the plus, what you would get instead is one plus six, right? Rather than one plus two times three, which is what one would expect. So because you didn't put parentheses here, you are just expanding this code into this text. And because the plus sign that appears after has more precedence, then what is being parsed is going to be something that is unexpected. And that is because C, the C macro system operates on the textual level. It doesn't know anything about, it doesn't have a notion of, you know, an operation about infix operations, their ordering and their structure. In Racket, we have actually a structured expansion that is aware of the nesting, it knows what is basically the S expression, right? It knows what is a literal. It knows what is um, a function call. It knows what is a, a variable and so on. It even understands bound and free variables, which that is to say that, um, you know, if you have an X and a Y, we'll see an example with that. That's, that's when we introduce the hygienic macro system. So, what is the problem of, of having a, a basic macro system that is just free text transformation like we have in C? Well, one thing that we have is I, I suggest you to follow this thread in Stack Overflow, which is covering is as someone is asking, what is the worst real worst real world macros and preprocessor abuse you've ever come across? So an example. <laughs> An example is this code where whoever created this macro that is just the dollar sign and is using the dollar sign to log to log what something is running. So their idea is you write this function, let's say you write foo, and you want to know you want to do some printouts of when you when that line is executed, you want the file and the line number to be printed out. So that's what the dollar sign is doing. So what the dollar sign is saying is it, when you execute this line, print something. When you execute this line, print something. And when you execute that line, print something. So the way this is defined is you, redef you define the, the dollar sign to be a macro. And what that macro does is it calls a logging function. And this is a very obviously terrible way of using a macro, right? Because it's very, you know, someone can do a mistake and just type a dollar sign and now they have a macro, a function call in the place where you, there shouldn't be any function call, right? If you were to write a dollar sign before this and you would get a very confusing error. There is also a very famous case of uh, macros in uh, the Unix born shell. If you, whoever wrote this code, uh, which is was available in the um, Unix shell, you would see this beautiful piece of code. And as you can see, there is a Pascal style if condition, but this is still C. It is C, but because because the C macro system is really just textual representation. The way they've described if was if is if in capital letters 
is expanded to if open parentheses then is expanded to close parentheses brackets else to all of this l if is this and fi which is the end of if is semicolon and then brackets so look at the beauty that they wrote what you see here is that is something that is very similar to algol 68 so whoever wrote this was familiar with algol which is a very old programming language as you can see from 68 at the time this programming language was famous so whoever wrote in c wrote it they they abused the macro system to be able to write their favorite language in c <laughs> so this code which exists if I, you follow this line you will see it um, it's in the version 7 of unix the code appears to be algol right a really old programming language but it's actually c so if you have any kind of bugs here have fun debugging that I also link a paper that was published in 2015 in ECOOP, which is a, a very um, famous uh, international conference in Europe. Uh, the love-hate uh, relationship with C preprocessors. And this is basically a study where scientists were trying to understand why people use macros like C macros, uh, how do they use them and so on. So generally, why people use macros was the major reason was portability to really be able to support different operating systems where you have macros that are uh, basically either enabling a piece of code or some other piece of code maybe some data types that are conditionally enabled um, it another the other biggest contributor to using or motivator to using macros is the ability to reduce the binary code size size those were the two main reasons that people gave it so for instance these three macros are they exist in in the vim editor if you're familiar with that and as you can see their use is really tricky so they are showing pieces of basically you know you have an exp an expression here highlighted in blue and you have two conditions but half of the expression is only conditionally available. So this end and the netbeans read file is only available if this constant is defined. So testing this kind of code is really non-trivial. Another example is function open that is in, in some operating systems has uh, three parameters and in other operating systems there's only two parameters uh, and what the macro system is doing is really just calling open with these three all the different combinations for unix and ms dos so obviously this is really hard to read um, but it allows to use the same file in multiple operating systems with just these macros another very ugly again for portability is you're defining the function msg netbeans w32 if you have this variable defined otherwise you create another function um, with a different function name <laughs> but the same code so processor the macros are used in c quite a lot again to summarize for portability and variability reasons and there are some insidious cases that are still very useful in practice and people still use it quite a lot so next we're going to study a bit how to use macros in racket now that we've seen um, hopefully bad examples hopefully for you bad examples of macro systems now we're going to study how does macro uh, macros work in racket we'll study that in the next video